Hello and welcome back to Forgotten Fronts. In today's episode, we'll be looking at the third mission in my Get Expert series, called McPherson's Ridge, the first episode where we'll be playing the Confederate States. And now for the history. If you don't want to hear the background history to this mission, a time will come up on your screen that will take you right to the mission. Wait for it. Now! As the Union Cavalry is relieved by the First Corps, the Confederates continue their attack, finding out what they thought was militia was actually the cavalry of the First Cavalry Division. Upon attacking the ridge, they encounter the first units of the First Corps. They are the First Division under James Wadsworth, who previously had marched down the Emmitsburg Road before leaving the road and doubling it over open country for a little over a mile in 40 pounds of gear in a hot day. So the troops were not in peak fighting condition. Wadsworth, being a political general, was not the best general tactically. So mispositioned the troops of Lysander Cutler's 2nd Brigade, out in the fields, unable to look over the ridge, and their flank exposed to Davis's brigade. But the badly positioned, tired troops of the 2nd Brigade must hold the line, as the 1st Brigade is on its way. But this brigade goes under a different name, the Iron Brigade, under Saladin Meredith, one of the best brigades of the Union Army of the Potomac who made their reputation on many battlefields throughout the Civil War. These were tough men from the frontier, from Wisconsin, Michigan, and Indiana, known for wearing black hardy hats. Welcome back to those of you who didn't want to hear the history. We are beginning the mission now. Here come our orders. General Heath, continue your attack against the militia on the ridge to your front, then continue your reconnaissance beyond the town. Be advised, General Lee doesn't want a general engagement at this time. Just like in the last mission, I need to go around take commanding all the subordinate brigade commanders, as they like to form weird lines that aren't particularly helpful, as the positions they start in are sufficient for what I want to do. While going over to Davis's brigade, I look at the 42nd Mississippi, who are in immediate canister range of the two cannons in front of them. So I have to move them away quite quickly before they engage the infantry in front of them, running up to the fence posts. But I'm doing this with the game paused as to not interfere with my opening strategies. But while that's going on, I get distracted by the noise of a galloping horse, which I track to one of the couriers that are riding to General Heath. With that mystery solved, I decide to use the infantry to the right flank of the Union infantry that is rushing to the fences to flank them while the 42nd Mississippi get farther away from the railway cut to get away from the cannon. While explaining my thoughts, we're going to go back to Archer's Brigade, who are going to be making the main assault on McPherson's farm. My plan for Archer's Brigade is simple and just like in history, to attack the left flank of the federal units garrisoning the farm, starting with the Zouaves, the guys in red. But these are no easy unit to crack as these are no ordinary Zouaves but these are the 14th Brooklyn, or the Red-Legged Devils, formerly part of what was called the Iron Brigade of the East. However, no regiment can stand long, with fire from four regiments coming from their front flank and rear. Moving back to Davis's Brigade, we can see the opening moves against the 147th New York. With the 2nd Mississippi threatening their flank, I moved the 47th out of range of the cannons. However, with their engagement with the Yankee troops, they'll be in the cover of wheat and not an actual fence post. But as the troops move into attack, a courier comes in, explaining the brigadier's positions. General Lee, the militia has withdrawn. My brigade has advanced just short of the reach to my front. I find the terrain difficult, and my command will be divided by the woods. Now at a range of canister, I get into the range of shellfire, which is slightly less potent. As I snake my troops around to attack the 147th New York, we can hear in the background the opening engagements of Archer's Brigade. Then, Davis, being a brilliant commander, decides to form our troops in the column before I tell him to go about to take command. And in the 1863 version of Spam, another courier message comes in. General Heath, that was not militia. One of the boys found the standard of the 1st Cavalry Division, and reports are that the first call has come to relief. This situation is very confusing. With that worrying revelation, the brigade commanders know what they're in for, a proper engagement with the Army of the Potomac. With that, we return to Archer's Brigade on our right flank, who are beginning to engage the 14th Brooklyn, or 84th New York. As you can see in the top left-hand corner, with the rangefinder thing. 
while the rest of Archer's Brigade advances through Herp's Woodlawn. Going back to Davis's flank, I notice that the 2nd Mississippi has been put in column. Not particularly very helpful of Davis to do this. So I tell him to rush up and attack the 147th New York's flank, figuring out that this was the 1st Brigade of the 1st Division. Archer moves out scouts to figure out where the others are, and to slow them down. General Archer! Send a company of skirmishers into the woods and tell them to report and harass any federal troops coming to support these brigades. Returning to Davis's brigade on our left flank, the second Mississippi has arrived on the 148th New York's flank and will pour deadly invalid fire upon them. While the 147th is in mortal peril without being in, in cover and being attacked by two regiments, one in their front and one in their flank, with the cannons giving little support. Returning to my right flank, the regiments from Archer's Brigade are breaking through Herp's Woodlot and are enveloping the left flank of the 14th Brooklyn. The 7th Tennessee is in a tricky spot between two regiments, and so they are difficult to place properly. But eventually I get it all set up, as I move them into the cornfield to the south, while trying to move the rest of the units of my brigade into position. I particularly tried to move out the 13th Alabama to the fence line, but seeing that would block off the regiment near them, I tell them to halt. In the meantime, the 14th Brooklyn have directed their fire upon the 6th Alabama Battalion. Looking over the battlefield, seeing everything is okay, I decide to direct my vision over onto my left flank, where elements of Davis's brigade are doing extremely well, as the 147th New York is beginning to break. But then I become overconfident and charge. They're breaking, boys! Four! Chase the steel be enough to push them down to Washington! Oh. Yes, I said overconfidence, and judging by these words, you can tell how this charge will go as my men go charging through the fields, crushing the crops in their wake, under fire from the federal units as they appear to withdraw. But thinking the regiment was large enough, I continue the charge as it seems we've only taken three casualties. I change their direction so they'll be charging towards the Union Regiment, almost as if they could see what how this charge will go. They halt, uh, but I brainslug them, I mean take command of them, and tell them to carry on. But the regiment gets caught up on the fence post as it continues its charge, and the 147th seemingly rally as they countercharge my men and force them back, much to the shock of the 2nd Mississippi, who stop firing. As my regiment retreats, the 147th fire upon them. The 2nd Mississippi not reacting, still in shock. But as soon as the 42nd get out of their firing arc, the 2nd Mississippi quickly regain their senses and open fire. I, in the meantime, was shocked and appalled, as the loss of a regiment this early in the mission would be disastrous. As I follow it for a moment, seeing where it would stop retreating. Moving back to Archer's Brigade, we can see the fire that we've been pouring down on the 14th Brooklyn has had a massive effect upon them, as our leftmost companies have been almost destroyed. So I send my regiments in at a closer range to increase their firepower upon them. But then the reason why I wanted to quickly disperse this part of the brigade arrives, as the Iron Brigade of the West arrives upon the field. Now things have become a little bit more dicey. I continue rushing these regiments forward, 
with hopes of scaring the 14th Brooklyn back and quickly dispersing the other regiment to take defensive positions against the Iron Brigade before it moves into position to attack us properly. Then the rebels burst from the woody threatening our flanking rear. In their intense fire, the leftmost company was completely destroyed. Looking up, I can see to my horror the entire Iron Brigade is upon us. And so in desperation, I look to any troops I have in reserve. Particularly the 42nd Mississippi that recently broke. Seeing that they would regroup filled me with hope. And so I moved to my artillery to move them to a closer range to help better support my infantry. Moving the rightmost batteries near the fence posts, quickly taking command of them as if I didn't, they would just not move, as we'll see in a moment, with Moore's battery. Then I moved a smaller battery under Marin to counter the Federal artillery and the railway cut, quickly taking command of them so they don't change their mind. With Grady's battery, I was tempted to put them in our center, but the fighting was still far too close. Suddenly, the skirmishers in the woods see the approaching Iron Brigade. There's more like Federal Infantry now! It's them damn black-headed fellers again! And just behind them, is their officer! Five dollars for the man who hits him! Drive them from the woods! Forward men, for God's sake, forward! <laughs> The death of General Reynolds will be a severe blow to the Army of the Potomac. And now I'm near Doubleday to his command of the Corps. And now, outside of the RP of this mission, the AI makes a crucial mistake and does not immediately counterattack with the Iron Brigade, but decides to form them up on the turnpike. All the while, the 14th Brooklyn are taking severe casualties that would have been easily avoided as almost the entirety of their leftmost companies have been destroyed, and now we're cutting into their center. And with that, we move back to Davis's brigade on our left flank. The 142nd New York is still holding out stubbornly, so I decide to move up Davis to support the 2nd Mississippi, in order to make them keep fighting, before going back to our right flank, where we finally see that the 14th Brooklyn are beginning to fall back. With that, I move my entire brigade forward, at risk of activating the Iron Brigade to counterattack. But wishing to sweep away the 2nd Brigade, I make that risk in order to take up defensive positions along the fence posts. I move up anyway. Seeing the cannons being a critical element that allows the 2nd Brigade to hold, I decide to do something heroic slash stupid with the 5th Alabama Battalion. Boss, let's get us some guns! Them's the only reason the Federals still stay! As we charge into an immense fire from the nearby Federal Infantry Regiment. After we capture the guns, we are forced back. I decide to charge headlong towards the cannon. Seeing that they are our smallest regiment, I decide they will be acceptable casualties. But they do not advance alone as they have the support of the entire brigade at their back. I quickly double them across the field, toward the cannons, moving up the 7th Tennessee to support them. And then, they easily, they charge forward, rushing the first cannon and easily capturing it, as shell fire comes in from our recently moved up batteries, to suppress the Union regiments. Then I move toward the other cannon to capture it, and easily seize it as well before the artillery crew managed to spike the gun. But the fire of the 95th New York is too much and my troops are forced back, but their losses will be worth it as the guns prove invaluable to us. But before that can happen, I have to withdraw the guns so that the Yankees can't recapture them, all the while being shot up by the 95th New York. 
However, as you can see, that is not the entirety of the Iron Brigade to our front, as I believe it's the 6th Wisconsin come in as reserve. Returning to our lines, the 14th Brooklyn breaks under our heavy fire, and the 95th New York, being a slightly worse unit, won't hold for long, especially with the new cannons at our disposal. And so I move up the rest of the brigade. However, in our offensive, not everything goes according to plan as one of the cannons rout from the battlefield. But while that's going on, I move back to Davis's brigade, who finally had broken the stubborn 147th. And so my attack on McPherson's Ridge came to begin in earnest, moving the 2nd Mississippi to the federal right flank, as well as moving in our reserve of the 55th North Carolina to support them, with the recent loss of the 42nd Mississippi. But defiantly, as you saw there, the 147th New York regroup, but their morale will be low. I go back to Archer's Brigade, right on time as elements of the Iron Brigade are moving to attack. But another spam message comes from a courier. General Heath, the infantry to our front is no ordinary state garrison. It's the first division of the Army of the Potomac. So far they're alone. A quick push might be able to force them back. With the Iron Brigade moving in to attack our position, the 95th New York has become a secondary priority. So I move forward my two regiments in my brigade to engage the Iron Brigade. While my captured cannon will rake the 95th New York as they're in the turnpike with canister fire. In the meantime, I move the 1st Tennessee to support the cannon. As the first few shots between my brigade and the Iron Brigade are exchanged, I moved in the 13th Alabama to support the 14th Alabama. Finally, going back to our artillery lines, I go to Moore's battery of artillery and move them up to the fence post, this time doing take command so I'll actually listen to me, moving them forward at the double. Going back to our fire lines, the effect of our moved artillery is immediate as a huge shell crashes through the 95th New York's ranks. In the meantime, take note of the farmhouse and the barn, as well as the pond just in the McPherson's farmstead. They'll be crucially important in this engagement. Anyways, going back to Davis's brigade, our troops are now in position to make a flanking attack on the troops on McPherson's Ridge moving in Davis to support. A quick clarification, the left side of the ridge is called McPherson's Ridge, while the right side is called Seminary Ridge, opposed to the gray thing in the center. Anyway, back to the battle. Now that the 55th North Carolina is moving into the federal right flank, and it should be noted that the troops there aren't very good. In the meantime, I've noticed that the 147th New York has regrouped, and so I'll have to deal with them at a later time. I moved the 1st Tennessee to support the cannon to take down the 95th New York, so we can surround the Iron Brigade Regiment out in front. And in case of emergency, I have the 13th Alabama in reserve, as they have full endurance and morale. Though in retrospect, it would have been wiser to use the 1st Tennessee as their regulars opposed to volunteers. I assume because of the terrain difficulties, Solomon Meredith doesn't commit the entire Iron Brigade against us, instead deciding to commit them piecemeal, starting with the regiment out in front. Going back to our artillery line, Moore is nearly in place, so I double him to get him into position faster, as our boys need their support. Checking the map, making sure that I'm not getting reinforcements from the other two brigades in the division, but I'm thinking of a different scenario. I noticed that the 42nd Mississippi has has rallied, and so I decided to move them up take, by taking the road to get them up quicker and in better shape. While this is going on, we can notice that the Iron Brigade Regiment out in the front is taking a lot of fire and doesn't know which way to face, as well as the canister is beginning to have an effect on the 95th New York. As we move through the fires in the as we saw them do so, we were under intense fire from several other regiments. As the engagement around McPherson's farm continues, I form up my brigade into a more cohesive line to increase firepower in theory and to make things a lot neater when I need to maneuver. I do this by moving the 7th Tennessee at the double, 
as well as contemplating moving in the 13th Alabama to support them. In the background, we can see the Iron Brigade shuffling around, but not actually attacking, which is more, which is good for us. I suspect this is because of the terrain of the houses, barn, and the pond that are blocking their path. In the meantime, we can see craters by the right flank of the 95th, which means that our canister is firing. And if you focus on them, you can tell when it hits as there's a dust cloud that flies up. Now that I think about it, the second Wisconsin is constantly switching back and forth is because that whichever way they turn, they get flanking fire. Looking over, then going to Davis's flank, we can see that the engagement is continuing, but the second Mississippi refuses to fire. And so I order them to advance 100 yards in order to get them into range, but not telling them to complete the order, as then we probably charge them. But as I tell them to halt, they become really difficult and decide to move backward, out of range again. And so I give them a different order. Yeah, sometimes the AI does this. I don't really know why. But I can understand in more difficult terrain, but in open ground doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if I were to presume, it was be because it's overlapping another regiment. But the troops on that flank, under Lieutenant Cutler, aren't particularly that good. So they'll easily break if we put enough pressure on them. Moving back to Archer's Brigade on our right flank, we can see the 95th New York has taken a lot of casualties as the 2nd Wisconsin flips back and forth. Going back to our artillery line, I go to check their batteries to see how, what their casualty count is. And you can see, not very high, partly because I've moved some cannons in some pretty bad spots. You can tell with the red circle with a line through it, well, the red crosshair with a line through it, that they have a block line of sight. As the firefight at McPherson's farmstead continues, with the 95th taking casualties and the Wisconsin Regiment flipping back and forth, I go around to check the other regiments. But as I go to the artillery line to move out Grady's battery, bad news is brought by courier. Sir, message from Colonel Shepard. I regret to inform you that General Arch has been captured in the fighting around the farmhouses on the ridge. With that terrible news, I decide that I need to move up the last battery of artillery, as our troops need more help than ever now. Moving them by the railway cut in the bridge, taking command of them so they don't refuse my orders. But checking over my flanks, the firefight seems to be going as well as usual. However, both sides are taking casualties. Casualties that I cannot afford as Archer's Brigade is quite small. And in exchange for this huge amount of casualties on both sides, no progress is being made. And so I make a quick glance at Davis's brigade to see if he's made any progress, but seeing that he hasn't, I go to check on our reinforcements, and the 42nd Mississippi are so slowly making their way there. After giving a brief inspection of my troops, to be satisfied that the firefight will continue in our favor, I go over to Davis's brigade. This firefight is going quite well, but as the regiments are so large, the firefight will continue for some time. While giving another inspection of Archer's Brigade, I go back to check on the 42nd Mississippi, who are only now figuring out the gravity of the situation. Them's a militia. We've seen them boys before. Them's a black-hatted fellows. 
Ashton Brigade's in trouble. 42nd Mississippi, advance at the top. As the 42nd Mississippi continue their way down the road, I notice that the majority of Grandy's battery is caught in the railway cut. And so, being a cruel person, I decide to double time them to their position. As our cannon, it probably doesn't matter d that they're at peak tiredness or not. Going back to Archer's Brigade, I'll go over to the 95th New York and the 2nd Wisconsin. Zooming in, we can see the casualties have started to take their toll, as the entire first rank is missing on both the units. As flanking fire and canister begin to take their toll. However, looking at the 14th Tennessee, the front rank is nearly cut down as well. As we go back to Davis's brigade, one of the Union regiments begin to crack and retreat in the miserable fighting conditions they are in. The fight in the root field was dead. It was hard to see the enemy, but for their standards. The smoke only made worse by the small fires caused by the remains of the cartridges. However, despite falling back quickly, I don't want to make the same mistake as last time and charge them, only to be repulsed. And so I allow the fire to dwindle them down. Then, I go through the over battle of Davis's brigade to detach the 42nd Mississippi. So when I do brigade movements with, it, with this unit, I don't accidentally move them as well, as they'll be on the other flank. And just in time too, as by the time we get to them, they're at the bridge crossing just before they reach the farmstead. Going back to Davis's brigade, I notice the 55th North Carolina has stopped firing. So right now I have to leapfrog my units one in front of the other in order for them to continue putting down an even level of fire. But I do this the same way as I did the other unit, by moving them forward 100 meters. But when I tell them to halt, they become a bit difficult as well, moving off to the side slightly as to not block the other unit. Then they continue to fire, but as I move up Davis to support them, the 76 New York breaks. Now I try using the brigade level movements to direct my units to attack, because I have to get used to this when it gets to the core and, and bigger division level scenarios, and even army scenarios later down the line. With a single line not being centered, be with one regiment in the, in the center and one to the right, and the double line being the two units directly in front of each other. And so I move the division up in my ad hoc manner that I normally do. Returning to Archer's Brigade, the 2nd Wisconsin breaks, followed by the 95th shortly afterward. And so I fall back to 14th Tennessee to take up defensive positions along the fence line. But that raises new problems, with the cannon battery on my left flank still posing a problem, and the reformed 147th New York, as well as shortly afterward the 95th reforms as well. However, for a spell I continued to move them up by the fence post before telling my men to lie down to quickly rest and all of the fighting, as the 95th were pinned down by artillery fire, which allows me to move up the 42nd to support them. Moving back to Davis's flank, I am now capturing McPherson's Ridge with my two regiments, as you can see with the Confederate battle flag in the icon up top, which is a victory point. However, the victory point won't last forever, and it will switch over to Seminary Ridge and the Iron Brigade will attack. But as it does, the 42nd Mississippi has reached our line, which will give us ample fighting power to break through the Union battery in our center. And so I begin to move them up, as well as getting the rest of our troops to stand up to support them, and to take up defensive positions along the fence posts. Then I go to General Heath to collect our replacement for General Archer, which is John Iyer, and quickly move him up to the farmstead. Sorry if you can hear that, my window's open. It's a flipping heat wave, it's damn hot. <laughs> but he's untrained, not exactly the best replacement for him. But he is necessary if we want to take the victory point, which will be the only reason why we win this, so yes. 
reacting to the sudden movement of our brigade, the 95th New York get up and open fire at our approaching units. I then do another check of our artillery to see if they're making much progress, which they're not, because of bad placement. But the 42nd Mississippi, now wanting to redeem themselves, steal their hearts and charge to disperse if not capture the battery to our center. Those guns are the only thing propping up the Yankee center, so steal your hearts and prepare your bones. And so I take command of them, moving them toward the cannon. All nonchalant like so they don't suspect the thing. But like I predicted earlier, the changing of the victory point and the moving of our brigade has awoken the Iron Brigade, and they begin to advance towards us. Thankfully I have my men in the defensive positions of the farm, so we'll stand a chance at least. But just like last time, they only move up one regiment, and so I outflank them with the two regiments on my right. But then the 13th Alabama gets distracted by something in the woods, before I quickly tell them to pay attention, and face them towards the Iron Brigade once again. The attack of the Iron Brigade distracted all my regiments, but the 1st Tennessee about faces towards the 95th New York once again as they begin to fire upon their rear. And then the 42nd Mississippi reach their position, opening a deadly volley upon the battery of cannons. I tell them to quickly close the distance, taking command of them and moving them forward at the double. The cannon firing canister shot in defiance, but it is far too late as the 42nd are far too close. As the 42nd advances, they get caught up on the fence, and the cannon is in prime range for canister. And then I order the charge, closing the last small gap between us and the cannon. Seeing the large rebel regiment advance behind me, the 147th begin to withdraw. And then with one final blast of canister fire, my men are upon the cannon, killing the crew quickly and, and capturing it for ourselves. Seeing the main thing that's holding their line up, the 147th New York and the 95th New York break, removing any threat from our center. Quickly going over to Davis's brigade, the situation is going well out there as well, as the last regiment standing, seeing their center collapse, is beginning to withdraw. Capitalizing on the collapse of the 2nd Brigade and Hull's battery, I move up the 42nd Mississippi to flank the 24th Michigan. Now that they are being attacked from the front and both flanks, they shouldn't be able to hold long, but these are the Iron Brigade after all. And so I move them close enough to get into range of both the 24th Michigan and the Victory Point. As soon as they get into position, I move up John Iyer. But then the 24th Michigan rushed forward. The 42nd Mississippi turned up to support our flanks. The black hats came to face them. However, three of their companies charged our regiment. We were exhausted and tried to get away. But they were well rested, caught up with us, and we were forced to surrender. And the 24th Michigan rushed forward. And I remember that I was saying to myself as they come forward and I tried to get the son of Tennessee to escape as to please stop, please stop, please stop as I don't want them to charge as my men are in no shape to commit to a melee. But I try to get them away too late and they're caught up in a melee. In the meantime, I move up the officer to attempt to take the capture point and send in Davis's brigade from his flank to support us as the fighting has stopped when the federal units collapsed. So I return to Archie's Brigade, just in time to see the 7th Tennessee surrender. Which means our army is in a bad shape. If you're keeping track, we've had two units retreat, we've had 
one route from the field and one surrender entirely. And when they surrendered, they put us in a, in a bad position, as they have broke my center, but in doing so have put themselves in a risky position, with my units on either side. After we rushed forward, count from the rebel regiment, we were in the thick of it, surrounded by rebels. Flash came from the other side, got one point of swore, and the time of the But then another regiment came to support our flank. Now facing fire from all flanks, the 24th Michigan is in a dire situation. Solomon Meredith recognizes this and sends the 19th Indiana to support me, which puts my brigade in a really precarious position. The 13th Alabama is the only fresh unit at hand. If they break, my entire line might cave. I quickly tell them to about face to meet the 19th Indiana. But the regiment keeps wanting to switch targets to something in the woods. And the 19th Indiana marches on. Only for when we open fire, they begin to move at the double. I honestly thought for a moment they would charge and break my other unit. But they stopped to fire, which relieved me a great deal. They struggle to form line as some of their units are caught on the farmhouses, giving us some free shots against them. With the 13th Alabama and able to fire upon the 24th Michigan, I put my capture cannon to use, wheeling it about to fire a canister upon the 24th Michigan, then getting the other capture cannon from the railway cut and forming it up next to it to follow suit. Before briefly going back to our artillery line, to check out their casualties so far. All the while, Davis's brigade comes in to support us, with the other two regiments under his command. Zooming in on the 24th Michigan, we can see the shell holes that show that we're firing canister upon them. All the while that the 24th Michigan is in this position, a commanding officer is next to them, inspiring them to fight on. Although they're mostly surrounded, under fire from shell, canister, and rifle fire, and they begin to break. See man, them black hats ain't nothing compared to you. Look at them run. The Yankees will soon fear the name of Davis's brigade. Even the most elite unit cannot stood under that fire for so long, and the 24th Michigan are pushed back. The officer near them, following them, attempting to rally them. And in response, I reform my line to go against the fence posts, and moving to surround the 19th Indiana. All the while, Davis's brigade comes up to support our rear, to act as a reserve. Initially, I moved in the 1st Tennessee, then following him up with this 42nd Mississippi to surround the 19th Indiana. Noticing the difference in the endurance between our, the remaining units of Archer's Brigade and the 42nd Mississippi and the two units of Davis's Brigade, I decided to switch them out as soon as the 19th Indiana is pushed back or a lull in the fighting ensues. Although finding the moving in the clustered terrain difficult, the 42nd Mississippi soon get upon the 19th Indiana's flank and open fire.
experiencing a large volume of fire on their flank, the 19th and Indiana advance straight towards them. However, many of their units get caught up on the buildings. Seeing how the battlefield has become a little bit safer, I decided to move up Harry Heath to inspect the battlefield a little bit more closely. And now the 19th Indiana is falling under the same folly as the 2nd Wisconsin, constantly reforming its lines while being fired upon from all sides, as well as being caught up on rough terrain in between the farmhouses. In the meantime, I move up the 1st Tennessee, and so they can fire upon them as it is they can fire upon the 19th Indiana. Being in such difficult terrain, the 19th Indiana decided instead to choose blades over guns and charge right for the 42nd Mississippi, and so I fall them back behind the fence press while the 1st Indiana open up on them. Here they come again, boys! Back to the fence post! The 1st Tennessee will cover the 42nd! Reload and fire by company! Fire! As the 19th Indiana advances, we fall back to the nearby fence posts, the first I see narrowly missing with his leftmost companies, and in another engagement in melee. But thankfully, that rush was only to get them on the other side of the barn, and the troops soon stop and form line, allowing my troops to about face and f pour deadly fire from their front and rear. As that is going on, I'm moving up Davis's brigade to form an active reserve to relieve our wary troops to prepare for the attack of the 6th Wisconsin. As we zoom into the firefight, we can see the absolute slaughter of the Iron Brigade's troops that were deployed piecemeal and so easily destroyed and dispersed in and around the pond, barn, and houses of the McPherson farmstead. I move in the 14th Tennessee to attack the 19th Indiana's rear. While an officer stays and attempts to rally the troops while under the deadly fire of several units. However, that officer risks life and limb for nothing as they quickly break. At this point, all I want to do is to replace the troops that have been fighting for nearly half an hour and are all wary with the relatively fresh troops from the rest of Davis's brigade. And so I move them up to the fence post, taking away some of the smaller wary regiments from Archer's brigade by both taking them off of my front line or moving them to flanks where they'll be less engaged. For example, I move the 42nd Mississippi off to what was our center, but which is now our left replacing it with the 2nd Mississippi. However, I keep some regiments like the 13th Alabama, who I keep on our right flank near the woods, while replacing other units like the two Tennessee regiments with the 55th North Carolina.
In the meantime, I'm moving up the second Mississippi so I can carry on holding the victory point for more points, chasing away the nearby Union officers, including their corps commander. Still concerned about an attack from the 6th Wisconsin, I move the second Mississippi to take cover on the fences on either side of the nearby turnpike. However, the regiment is facing back and forth. Seeing that we are engaged to our center and left, I move the 13th Alabama to support our left flank. And at the same time, the 42nd Mississippi is now arriving at their position on the left flank as well. and now the 6th Wisconsin have been deployed, making for the pond and farmhouses where the other regiments of their brigade were destroyed. Then suddenly they change direction and make for our right flank, which is far more open, which is better for their larger numbers. And I move my men in response, moving to flank them as they open ranks and prepare to fire. Even though earlier I was attempting to move my troops, the 1st Tennessee is caught in the line of fire and I have to commit them moving them more toward our center so they don't overlap with our other regiments. However, later on I plan to replace them, and do. All while this is going on, another regiment from their brigade advances, the 7th Wisconsin, the first brigade they committed. The 7th Wisconsin was probably committed, as the 6th Wisconsin is one of the most veteran of the entire brigade, and they don't want to waste it all in one place by getting flanked and fired upon from all sides. However, the 7th Wisconsin doesn't do a lot of fighting, only deciding to do a few pot shots at the 2nd Mississippi when they get into range, and so I have to force them back to keep them out of range, so they can continue their flanking fire upon the 6th Wisconsin. But while the regiment is turning to face the other regiment firing upon its flank, it is in danger of being charged by the 6th Wisconsin, and so I had to find that fine line in between the two in the meantime, I'm moving the 1st Tennessee to our right flank, where it won't be engaged, and relieving them with the 13th Alabama. Eventually, I give up trying to find the right angle between the two Iron Brigade regiments, and decide to tell the 2nd Mississippi to fall back. In order to discourage the Iron Brigade from attacking, I move up the 42nd to support the 2nd Mississippi. While this is going on, I decide to move up my 3-gun battery to the ridge near the farmstead, but absentmindedly select one of the guns, before going back and selecting the commander and moving the entire battery up. And now the 6th Wisconsin is starting to fall back as they're under pressure from all flanks and front as well as artillery fire. As I move up the 42nd to support the 2nd Mississippi, the 6th Wisconsin breaks, and the same Union officer who's been trying to rally the Iron Brigade 
in order to encourage them to hold the line. As a few Union officers, including the Corps commander, watched the fire freight from just outside the railway cut. Instead of relieving the 1st Tennessee, I moved the 13th Alabama to attack from the railway cut into the flank of the Iron Brigade. Which is ironic, because around at the same time in the real Battle of Gettysburg, the Iron Brigade would be charging Confederate units in the railway cut, forcing them to surrender. But before the 13th Alabama could get into position, Victory! We get a major victory of 5,771 points. Now to go over the units. Just like in the Scourge of War Waterloo Let's Plays, I decided only to cover the infantry for now on. So there's less messing around in the order of battle, as well as they don't really contribute huge amounts anyway, at least when I use them. And we can see my brigades have done quite well. With most units getting around 50 or nearly 200 kills, or score. In Archer's Brigade, while in Davis's Brigade, most units got nearly 100 kills, with the smallest being, the smallest being 82 score. Going over to the Union side, we can see despite their crappy deployment, they didn't do too bad. The uh, 2nd Brigade got minus 300 points, the Iron Brigade got plus 20, which is good considering they were thrown in one at a time and just horribly deployed. But what did the real Heath have to say about the first day of Gettysburg? Well, I have the report here. On July the 1st, my division, accompanied by Pangram's Battalion of Artillery, was ordered to move at 5 a.m. in the direction of Gettysburg. On nearing Gettysburg, it was evident the enemy was in the vicinity of the town in some force. It may not be improper to remark that at this time, 9 o'clock, on the morning of July 1st, I was ignorant to what force was at or near Gettysburg, and supposed it consisted of cavalry, most probably supporters of the brigade or two of inf most probably supported by a brigade or two of infantry. On reaching the summit of the second ridge of the hills, west of Gettysburg, it became evident that there were infantry, cavalry, and artillery in and around the town. A few shots from Pengram's battalion, Mary's battery, scattered the cavalry vedettes. One of the first shells fired by Pengram, most mortally wounded Major General Reynolds, then in command of the force at Gettysburg. My division, now within a mile of Gettysburg, was disposed as follows. Archer's brigade in line of battle... On the right, on the right of the turnpike, Davis's brigade on the left, on the same road, also in line of battle. Pettigrew's, Pettigrew's brigade and Heath's old brigade, Colonel Brockerborough commanding, were held in reserve. Archer and Davis were now directed to advance, the object being to feel the enemy, to make a forced reconnaissance and determine in what force the enemy were, whether or not he was massing his forces up on Gettysburg. Heavy columns of the enemy were soon encountered. Davis on the left advanced, driving the enemy before him and capturing his batteries. General Davis was unable to hold the position he gained. The enemy concentrated on his front and flanks, an overwhelming force. The brigade, the brigade maintained its position until every field officer, save two or three, were shot down, and its ranks were terribly thinned. On the right of the road, Archer encountered heavy masses in his front, and his gallant little brigade, after being almost surrounded and overwhelmed by forces in his front on both on both flanks was forced back. The service lost at this time the, that most gallant and 
Mitchell's officer, Brigadier General Archer, who fell into enemy hands, together with some 60 or 70 of his men. The enemy had now been felt and found to be heavy in force in and around Gettysburg. The strike of the miners failed, sir, and many of the miners have perished. Please, call me Wilbur. Yes, sir, er, Wilbur. It must be my habits from being in the service so long. That's why you're my second in command. Now back to business. You need to go to our friend in Montgomery and tell him to make another batch of those posters to inspire more of the workers to join us and follow the example of the miners of Birmingham. Oh, and also, tell him to cue the bullshitness down to the minimum this time. That last bash sounded too much like something out of the Paris Commune. In the meantime, we need to set up the seeds for another strike. So soon after the other one? The workers will be reluctant. After such a brutal suppression. Unfortunately, it's the only way to cover up the plan. Did you honestly think we were going to defeat the most powerful empire in the world through poorly organized strikes? Well, I thought they were to distract the British while we obtained weapons and declare our independence. What did you think those rare materials were for? To sell to get more weapons? No, they were to help us strangle the baby in its crib. But now that we have the materials, we'll need the plans, and someone who, with the knowledge to put them to use. We'll need to send out to the educators. To the educated? Uh, perhaps they need a new code name. <laughs> 